Hello students, you would have studied about how to design a life space. But today I am here to talk to you about the special considerations you have to find in designing life space. Designing for people with special needs and design that deals ethically with the environment is more crucial than designing for normal people. For years, the needs of special group of people who found designed environment difficult or even impossible to use were often ignored by the designers. Today, however, because we have been made aware of special needs and because the law requires that those needs be addressed, design for special population is a standard part of design practice. An awareness of the importance of caring for the fragile environment that sustains life has also had a significant impact on the practice of design. The main objectives of this lesson today, who is a special population? People with distinctive but similar design needs constitute special populations. Such populations include persons with limited motion, hearing or vision as well as the elderly who may have some form of impairment in one or more of these areas. It is important to note that impairments need not be measured by fixed standards and that every one of us is prone to some type of limitations whether temporary or chronic. The designation of special population is helpful only because it makes us aware of needs. Different kinds of physical impairments may require conflicting considerations. For example, curves that are cut away for the wheelchair bound do not signal the blind that they have reached the street. The person in the wheelchair prefers spaces that are open and larger than normal while the blind person is more comfortable in a smaller space where many things are within reach. The hearing impaired needs a space with little sound reverberation while the blind needs an acoustically live space to help them find their way. Universal design. Universal design implies that well planned designs will meet the needs of every user without drawing attention to person with disabilities. For example, Older buildings with many steps are not accessible to regular wheelchair users. Ramps can be installed to make the building accessible. But the ramp is a special addition and while it is functional, it draws attention to the wheelchair user who must use a different method of entry. New facilities designed on level grade where all can enter in the same manner are examples of universal design everyone accommodated without drawing attention to distinction of ability. Accessible design. Accessibility is the law in non-residential design. It is optional in design for single family homes. Given the fact, however, that we may all encounter some form of impairment at some point in our lives, it is remarkable that our home design rarely are planned accordingly. Some have the foresight and plan for the family members at some point of their lives. However, universal design works well for everyone whether impaired or not. Design for motion impairments. People with impaired motion may be ambulant, disabled, meaning that difficult in walking may require the use of crutches, a cane or a walker. The chair bound disabled depend on a wheelchair for mobility. The motion impaired may also have some loss of ability to use their hands. This section will cover list of design recommendations for people with motion impairment. Steps and ramps. A minimum slope for ramps is best with a rise of 1 foot for every 12 feet of length that is 1 is to 12. Steps should not have protruding nosing which will catch the toes of the those with stiff legs, braces or other leg problems. All ramps and steps should be well lit with focus lighting. At the top, a handrail should be 34 to 38 inches above the ramp or steps. Handrails should be oval or round with 1.5 inch hand clearance between the rails and the wall. 
the handrail should have a gripping surface of one and a quarter to one and a half inch and should not be interrupted by newel post or other elements. Passage and turning for a single wheelchair 32 inches is minimum clearance at a point such as door 36 inches is better and 36 inches is minimum clearance in a continuous passage 42 to 48 inches is better minimum clearance for two chair to pass each other is 60 inches the space required for a wheelchair to make a 180 degree turn is a clear space of 60 inches the clear flow space required for a wheelchair is 30 by 48 inches. The force needed to push a door open should not exceed 8 pounds of pressure. Lever type door handles are easier to operate than round door knobs which are slippery and hard to operate with limited strength. A kick pla plate at the bottom of the door protects the door from the impact of a wheelchair's footrest. Floors should have a flat, non-skid surface. If carpet is used, then it should be securely attached without a cushion or pad. Pile depth should not be more than half an inch. Flooring materials should be flushed since a change in depth greater than half an inch forms a barrier. Now we will see about the requirements in a kitchen. All areas of a kitchen should be accessible to a frontal approach as well as parallel approach by a wheelchair. Varying countertop heights are recommended. A low counter near the sink, the foot preparation is helpful. Heights of 28, 32 and 36 inches are good with a maximum depth of 24 inches so that items on the countertop can be easily reached. Upper cabinet should be adjustable to several heights. 8 inch above the counter is the minimum for a very small user. Handles on upper cabinets should be mounted at maximum height of 48 inches from the floor with those on lower cabinets a minimum of 27 inches from the floor. Leaving space under the counter especially at the sink allows a wheelchair to approach. The sink controls should be mounted on the side or not more than 18 inches from the front of the counter for easy reach. Pull out trays allow better access than standard drawer and shelves. Wall mounted ovens and microwaves allow wheelchair access. Cooktops should have staggered burners so that the user do not have to reach over a hot front burner to access a back burner. Cooktop controls should be front mounted for easy reach by a seated person. Now we will see what is the requirement for bathrooms. Door should be at least 36 inch wide, preferably 39 inches will be better. No cabinet under the sink makes the vanity accessible. Toilets should be wall mounted that is 19 inches off the floor for easy approach of a wheelchair. Grab bars must be anchored in wood so that they will support at least 100 kgs. Textured non-slip grab bars mounted 32 to 38 inches above the floor make access easier. A seat in a shower is also helpful. Shower controls should be accounted not higher than 32 inches from the floor and should be a lever type single mixing control. Faucets at the sink should also be a lever controlled as well as side mounted. Medicine cabinets should be mounted lower in a side wall so that they can be easily accessed. Vanity mirrors should be installed low enough to be used by someone seated in a wheelchair. Non-slip flooring is imperative as is good ventilation to prevent condensation that might cause slipping. Now we will see about the requirements in a bedrooms. The height of the mattress should be equal to the height of the wheelchair. To accommodate a wheelchair, there must be a clear space of 60 inches, usually between the bedroom door and the bed or between the storage space and the bed. A minimum of 36 inches at the foot and far side of the bed will facilitate making the bed and cleaning. Closets. 
bifold or sliding doors are the best. Rods should be mounted 45 to 54 inches axis from a wheelchair. Shelves higher than 50 inches are not accessible from a seated position. Slide out shelves are more accessible. Around the house, electrical outlets should be 27 to 28 inches above the floor. Switches should be 36 inches above the floor. At least 160 inches diameter turning space is required in each room of the house. Drawer pulls throughout the house should be D-shaped for better gripping. Window sills set at a maximum of 36 inches make windows accessible to wheelchair users. Now we are going to see what are the design requirements for a hearing impaired individual. Design can help to make the quality of their lives better by alleviating some of the problems inherent in the interior environment. Many of the problems associated with hearing loss center around noise and sound reverberation as well as adequate light for manual communication that is signing and lip reading. Now we will see what are the things to be considered while designing the residential space. Carpet and fabric wall covering reduce noise reverberation and improve the acoustics for the hearing impaired. Good lighting is imperative for adequate decoding of manual communication and lip reading. Good natural light helps visually and also create the psychological feeling of openness and well-being. Furniture arranged in a semicircle or U-shape facilitates signing and lip reading by providing clear sight lines from speaker to listener. A round dining table is better than a rectangular table because it provides clear sight lines. Visual signals such as flashing lights can provide important visual cues. The lights are activated by the telephone, doorbell, alarm clock, fire alarm, smoke detector or a crying baby. The lights can be placed in panels or strategic locations throughout the house. Because of the addition of extra electronic devices, adequate outlets should be planned to avoid the unnecessary use of extension cords. Design for visually impaired. People with impaired vision rely heavily on the senses of hearing and touch. Consequently, tactile indicators and acoustics are critical for day-to-day -day activities in familiar environments and for wayfinding in unfamiliar public spaces. Things to consider by visually impaired people. The blind need tactile warning of danger. Door handles may be textured to indicate a dangerous area beyond the door and landings and curves can be textured to indicate steps or changes of grade. Outdoor hanging or projecting objects, even plants and tree branches that extend into the path of the blind person should be avoided. Where there is more than one story, a handrail should extend continuously from floor to floor rather than stopping at the landing. Signage is important. Small group of letters and numbers can be easily read with the fingers but larger group of letters and long texts are difficult for the blind to read. Persons born blind learn braille while most persons blinded later in life do not. Signage should include both letters, numbers and braille symbols. To be useful, tactile signals and signage should be uniform throughout the building. Audible signals for the blind are helpful at crosswalks, in elevators and for emergency systems such as smoke detectors and fire alarms. Gas cooktop tend to be better for the blind because the gas makes a sound as it burns. In addition, electric elements retain heat after they are turned off, which can be dangerous. Controls should be mounted where the blind will not have to reach over the flame or to operate the cooktop. A lip on the counter may be helpful in preventing objects from being pushed off the edge. 
furniture should be rounded corners and some padding of table edges may be advisable. Her hook next to electrical outlets might be desirable to hang a plug where it can be found easily. Changes of grade in flooring materials are obstacles for the blind and should be avoided. Designs for the elderly. People are living longer today than ever before. As a result, the elderly population is growing rapidly and becoming an important political and social force. The concerns of the elderly include limited mobility, loss of hearing and loss of visual acuity. Consequently, all the considerations listed above apply to the elderly. There may also be loss of memory or other cognitive function that makes some tasks more difficult. We will see what are the things to be considered. Visual contrast is important in judging space and distance. For example, a countertop should be light or dark in value to contrast with the floor. This helps with the depth perception and makes the edges more obvious. The same is true for a tabletop with depth perception. It is important. In some public spaces and facilities designed for the elderly, wayfinding is important. In a long hallway, the location of doors can be indicated with a slight recess in the wall surrounding the doors. Distinctive pieces of furniture and art can be visual reminders of location. Color coding of areas or flows may also prove helpful. Decreased control over bodily function may make it desirable to select textiles for upholstery that have been specially treated to resist moisture or laminated with a thin layer of plastic. We will see about the requirements for other special populations. Other special populations include children, the mentally ill, the terminally ill and many others. Unlike the design needs of those with physically impairments, the design needs of these groups do not always lend themselves to universal design. The considerations associated with these groups are important and worthy of designers' attention. Environmental considerations. Designers have an ethical responsibility to be aware of the impact the designs have on the environment. That responsibility includes ensuring the aesthetic quality of the design so that it will not be prematurely discarded as well as avoiding waste and pollution. Everyone benefit when the environment is managed wisely. Design longevity and the environment. Good design stands the test of time and adds quality to a community indefinitely. Historic sites or buildings often add value to an area, but poor designs may never live to become historic. It will be raised to make way for new development. Older but visible buildings that no longer serve their original purposes have been given new life by thoughtful design changes. Good design can create and preserve communities that are pleasant and a genuine source of pride. Long-lasting design is a friend of the environment. Things to be considered are Encourage community governments to establish design review commission to monitor design quality and establish design criteria for builders and developers. Encourage local governments to establish green belts and present green spaces as well as engage in city forestation or tree planting. Encourage preservation and adaptive reuse of existing building. Now we will see in detail about waste in the environment and green products. There are two types of resources used by builders and developers, renewable and non-renewable. Fortunately, some forms of both renewable and non-renewable resources such as metals, plastics and paper products can be recycled. When buildings are demolished or interiors refurnished, the remnants will be magically disappear. They have to be removed to a landfill unless they can be recycled. 
space for landfills is increasingly hard to find and good ethics point to recycling. In order to be environmentally sound, materials, finishes and furnishings should be chosen for good design and quality which in turn produce longevity and decrease waste. When they do wear out, materials, finishes and furnishings should be recycled whenever possible. Things to be considered. Select and specify materials and finishes that will wear well. Reupholster furniture rather than discard it. Specify systems, furniture, modular, office or landscape from manufacturers that will refurbish this product when it is dated or worn. When possible, specify blanket wrapping rather than cardboard packing for shipping or new furniture. In appropriate settings, specify pattern carpets that will hide soil and wear an extend its life. Recycle whenever possible and encourage recycling by designing recycling centers in residential and non-residential facilities. Encourage recycling in local communities. Specify green products whenever possible. Air pollution in the interior environment. Some buildings are uninhabitable because of poor air quality that causes users to become ill. This problem is sometimes referred to as sick building syndrome. Many of the toxins found in the interior air can be mitigated by plants. Plants have the ability to clean the air naturally. When well cared for, they also provide a wonderful aesthetic quality of life to the interior space. Things to be considered are allow at least 24 hours of good ventilation for off-gassing of new furnishings. When possible, specify particle board and plywood products without formaldehyde. Make whatever design decisions are necessary to ensure adequate air circulation. Ensure that fresh air intakes for HVAC systems are away from locations where automobile exhaust will be present. Work with local government to prohibit smoking in public facilities. Ensure the building foundations are carefully sealed to provide rodent contamination. Use plants to clean the air naturally. Lighting and energy conservation. Efficient electric lighting and increased use of natural light could save up to 90% of the electricity. We will see what are the things to be considered now. Wherever possible, use LED lighting. Use higher levels of light only where and when needed to accomplish specific tasks. Use dimmers and timers to save energy and extend the life of incandescent lamps. Use natural light from windows wherever possible before resorting to electric lighting. Also consider clerestories, skylights, light pipes and atria to bring natural light into a building. Windows and energy conservation. On an average, 10 to 25 percent of internal heating or cooling is lost through windows and similar amount of heat gain occur through windows during warm seasons and in warm climate. Low tech solutions and new high performance window technologies can improve those statistics. Things to be considered are wherever possible specify high performance windows for new construction. Insulate and cock window frames. Use low tech solutions such as planting deciduous trees, those that lose their leaves seasonally are called deciduous trees and to block the suns directly in the summer and let in the sun rays in winter. Design overhangs to block summer sun and the winter sun as the sun's angle changes seasonally. Use screens or awnings for additional sun control. To conclude, by emphasizing the issues of environment and the universal access are ever present in the process design and not merely special consideration to be discussed in isolation. The ideas and recommendations presented should be applied to all. 
whether focus is on electrical system and lighting, fabrics or historical styles, it is important to take advantage of whatever opportunities are available to maximize the accessibility and environmental friendliness of every design project. This is not only good ethics but good design sense. Thank you.